Smile. That was fascinating. And, um, you know, I, uh, I'm someone who um, is somewhat new to this, and I come at it not from the technical and the expertise that a lot of you have, but as a journalist who has been studying, looking at what a lot of you have been doing over the last few years, um, what Uber and Airbnb and others in the United States have been doing, plus the broader economic trends that we all have been experiencing. And, um, and based on that, wrote a book looking at a lot of this called Raw Deal, which kind of gives you an idea of, of where, I, where my perspective was, um, how the Uber economy and runaway capitalism are screwing American workers. And now I'm looking at this in Europe and in Germany in particular, um, and, and it's, it's all quite fascinating seeing the, the transatlantic differences. I mean, in terms of the United States, in many ways, um, what is going on to the dominant part of the sharing gig collaborative economy, of course, is Uber and Airbnb. And it's really a cautionary tale about what this, these technologies can do if we don't get this right. If a lot of the people in this room who are trying to come up with an alternative, um, we're, you know, you'll see these technologies being used in the latest turn of, of capitalism, platform capitalism, however you want to call it. Um, you have to understand what's happening in the United States in the terms of what's happened to the broader economy, 2008, 2009. We had a, a dramatic recession, worse than in, um, since the, the one whose name cannot be named. Uh, and, and, then, um, and then the recovery since then has been uh, ra rather uh, deformed in many ways. A lot of the so-called so good jobs in the United States that had things like health benefits, safety net benefits, um, a degree of job security, um, decent wages, those have been replaced by other types of jobs. In fact, Lawrence Katz at Harvard uh, basically came up with a new number that says that all the new job creation in this so-called recovery have been non-regular non types of jobs. So ones that are basically what we call 1099 workers, contractors, freelancers, um, uh, temp workers. A fifth of the new jobs created in this recovery have been temp work jobs. Um, so, and you see companies like, uh, for example, Merck, the large pharmaceutical company who, um, you know, they had a plant in Philadelphia. They sold the plant to another company. Company comes in, lays off all 400 workers, hires back the exact same 400 workers as contractors, and, um, and then proceeds to make the exact same drugs for Merck that Merck was making for itself. And by doing this, employers in the United States get out of about 30% of labor costs. Because if you're a contractor, you don't have any kind of health care safety net. You're not, uh, subject, you're not protected by a lot of uh, labor protections. You don't even have the right to organize or join a union if you're a contractor in the United States. Um, and so you can see the incentive of the employers to, to go to this type of model. Uh, and at a certain point, when no, enough of them are doing it, if you're doing it, and you're doing it as an employer, and I'm not doing it, I'm, I'm paying 30% more in labor costs. So it becomes uh, something that drives the economy, becomes a race to the bottom, what I call the steroids of the economy. You know, it's like in, if, if a football player is doing steroids and others aren't, then that football player has, has a, 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 an advantage, so everyone, everyone else starts doing it. These are the types of things that are going on in the economy. Um, Auto companies, uh, you know, most of the, uh, the workers you see in an auto company in the United States right now are temp workers. You know, they're doing the exact same job on the line as someone else who works for the company. But as, as a temp worker, they um, have lower pay, very little job protection, and very little uh, in the way of a safety net. Uh, looking at, um, you know, you think, oh, it's blue collar. No, you look at universities. More and more universities, about half of the professors at universities now or what we call adjunct faculty. Adjunct is just another fancy term for a temp worker. You don't know if you're going to be teaching the next semester or not. And you know, I imagine many of you are, are probably familiar with this uh, type of situation. So this is the context that the gig economy, sharing economy, collaborative economy, and these terms are used somewhat interchangeably, but I know di different people have their own definitions. But in terms of the average Mer Americans, what they understand to the extent that they're paying attention to this kind of thing at all, these terms are synonymous. And so this new type of way of working comes along in this broader context. Um, so now you look at the gig economy. What are these companies? Well, in a way, they're redefining how corporations work in the United States. If you think about the, um, the, the post-World War II industrial model of corporations, first you had big horizontal corporations, production, marketing, design, research. Everything was done under a single roof. 
auto companies being the classic example. Then about the 1980s along comes companies like Apple, Nike. They outsource production to, um, to low wage countries, but they still keep, production, uh, keep marketing, design, research under the roof. Now these new businesses, uh, they are little more than an app and a website. And they have a small core of employees and executives that can use technology to oversee uh, an army of freelancers and contractors. Uh, I mean, Uber and Airbnb get the, a lot of the attention, but my favorite example, the one to really watch, is uh, one called Upwork. How many people here have heard of Upwork? A lot of people, so you know what it is. It's about 250 regular employees who are, uh, it's based in San Francisco, where I'm from, so I've been watching these companies for a number of years now. Um, and they can use technology to oversee 10 million freelancers around the world. And these freelancers are doing things like, you know, um, there are architects, lawyers, engineers, uh, there are graphic designers, logo designers, translators, a huge number of occupations are getting work through this type of platform. But it, you, it's kind of curious, you can go on there and you can see, uh, that, you know, here's a worker from the United States saying, I'd like to make $60 an hour for this job. And here's someone from um, Netherlands saying, I'd like to make 50 euros an hour for this job. And here's someone from Thailand, India, Philippines saying, I'll take $2, two euros an hour for this job. And those people are highly trained. They have access to technology. They can finish the job, upload it to Dropbox or whatever. They can do the job. And so it's created this online auction. And when you can watch the bids going lower and lower and lower in which you have workers who are competing against each other from around the world in this kind of race to the bottom. And of course, these are contractors. They don't have any kind of safety net, any kind of health care that they get as a, as a result of this job. They have really no job protection. A huge number of these contractors um, you know, don't get paid for the work that they do. And they have very little recourse to try and get that pay. Uh, and, and on top of that, you know, this contractor freelancer life, they spend a huge amount of time just looking for the next job. You know, bidding on things, they don't get it. Uh, you know, you get the job and you, know, you don't get paid for any research or training you might have to do to complete that job. You only get paid for that moment when you finish the, the, whatever you've been hired to do and you send it off to them, then you get paid. There's no payment for, you know, a lot of people are used to a, a, a work lifestyle where you go to work nine to five, eight to four, whatever it is, and you're paid for every minute you're at, you're at your job. You're paid to go to a meeting. You're paid if you need to get extra training. You're paid to stand around the water cooler and talk to your coworkers. That's where some of the best ideas come from. Um, in this new way of work, you're only paid for that moment when you produce that product. That's it. And all the other time is on your own time and dime. That's a dramatic um, proposal in how we conceive of work that is being put before us by these sorts of companies. Um, they, you know, these sorts of companies, they basically want a labor force that they can turn on and off like a water tap. That's what they want. And so that's where I, I, I'm talking about this because in terms of the collaborative economy, a true collaborative economy, where you want to create platforms that are going to allow people to plug in in non-exploitative ways, you still have to recognize that we're, we're, we're proposing, if we're not careful, we're going to buy into this proposal of how we're redesigning work. And we have to think of how the other types of things are going to come along with it. I mean, so if you create a platform where um, you know, it's not owned by the Ubers and the venture capital funders of Silicon Valley, but it's owned by us. What kind of social relations will you have between the workers and those who are controlling that platform? Because someone is going to control that platform. Even if it is more collaborative, somebody's going to control it. How do you make sure that workers who are working this way have access to a safety net, have a portable safety net they take from job to job? How are you going to make sure that those workers and the companies, even the collaborative companies, pay into the social security system. Because if you don't pay into that social security system, it's going to undermine what uh, you know, even decent governments do when you, you, know, when you have uh, good values and, and good uh, safety net that are supporting workers. Um, so these are, the, you know, I think, are, are tough questions that we have to figure out. Um, you know, if you look at a company like Airbnb, for example, beyond what Airbnb is, which, you know, it started out as a good idea. Uh, the idea that you, right, you can use your, you know, platform to rent out a spare room in your home and make some extra money. I think, you know, most people are saying that was okay.
But Airbnb has been totally taken over by um, uh, professional real estate operatives who are using the platform to rent out to tourists and eating up local housing stock. And you see a host on that platform with dozens of properties in New York City. Some of the hosts have over 200 properties they control. And in San Francisco, where I'm from, I can take you down streets and point to building after building where entire buildings were evicted to make room to, to rent them on Airbnb to tourists and, and eating up the local housing stock. And if you don't have enough housing for local people, then you have too, your vacancy rate is too low. The cost of rents go up higher. Then people have to move out of the city. We're seeing that in San Francisco. Now they have to commute back into the city in order to work, so that's bad for the environment. There's all these knock-on effects that are happening as a result of these platforms. But here's, beyond that, here's what Airbnb and Uber really are. They're proposing a new corporate right, that these sorts of companies should be able to set up operations first and figure out the local laws and tax laws down the road. I mean, Airbnb will tell you, oh, we want to pay our taxes, but we're in 34,000 cities around the world and we just haven't had time to figure it all out, but we're slowly getting there. They'll tell you that they've got 200 cities now that they're paying taxes to. That's a longer story, there's a lot of uh, hype to that, but let's give them the benefit of the doubt. That, at that rate, it's gonna take them 50 years to reach all 34,000 cities. Um, but beyond that, I mean, what other company? I mean, imagine if a company like Boeing or um, you know, a company like Volkswagen or whomever, you know, is certain this right of setting up operations first and figuring out the laws and the tax laws and whether we're gonna pay taxes or not later. If all companies did this, it would be complete chaos. So we, you know, this is something that is, is, is extremely important that we can't let these companies get away with asserting this type of new corporate right. So I'm, I'm just gonna wrap up very quickly and saying some of my ideas are where I think we need to go with this kind of thing. Um, one of the things that we need to do is to learn how to develop more nonprofit apps. We have to either get government funding or get um, NGOs who will develop apps that, are, that have a different incentive than for-profit apps. Uh, because, you know, I mean, I'll give you one example. Um, I was in Berlin for five months uh, not that long ago for a project. And it, despite having a great transit system, you can still see all these people who are driving into Berlin to, to work driving in their car by themselves. I thought this is like the United States where we don't have carpooling. You'd think the Germans would have it, have it uh, together better than this. Well, unfortunately they don't. But you know, we could create an app where carpoolers could find each other. And the for-profits are not gonna do this because there's no money in it for them. Um, you know, if, if, you know, once you and I find each other through the app, we don't need them anymore. Then so we could do it through text, through email, through however, to connect and to, to drive together. So there's no money, there's no incentive for them, they're not gonna do it. This is an example where, you know, let's harness a lot of the young people who are graduating, they know how to do this kind of stuff, harness them to create these nonprofit apps. There's a, a new nonprofit app connecting grocery stores and other places that have more food than they, than they know what to do and they're throwing it out, they're throwing it into dumpsters. They can use the app to connect those people, those organizations, those businesses to organizations that distribute food to the poor. Um, there's lots of ideas that we could generate about how to use nonprofit apps. Congestion in cities, uh, you know, it's getting worse, particularly because of ride sharing. You, when you have Uber and Lyft and these other companies suddenly throwing thousands of new cars out on the street, uh, surprise, surprise, suddenly the streets are more congested. I mean, it's a pretty straightforward connection. Yet many Americans aren't making that connection. They're wondering why it takes so long now to get anywhere. Well, you have the services dedicated to flooding the streets with cars. Um, but we could use the Uber app, actually, to track, tech, track cars, track uh, public transit, track ride sharing, track taxis, track, track delivery trucks, all the different types of vehicles that are being used on our public streets. You have to think of the streets as a public utility. And we could use the app-based technology to allow us to track this in a way that could create congestion zones like London and Stockholm and other places have. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. There's a lot of great work to be done um, but we need to get very concrete in our plans and come up with, uh, you know, real plans that we can put forward to people that they can buy into because the Ubers and the Lyfts and the Airbnbs, they have their product. They're out there with it now. So if we're going to create platform cooperatism, what are our products that we're going to put out there that people can use as an alternative to these uh, platform capitalism uh, platforms? Thank you.